Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Hello and welcome to episode number 30 of the Wall Street Lab podcast. And this week we are talking about the placement agent business in the alternative investment space with probably the best person we could have imagined to discuss this topic with. Exactly, because we talked to Charlie Eaton, who founded Eaton Partners in 1983 as one of the first and now largest placement agencies in the world. In 2016, then, they got acquired by Stiefel Financial. Charlie graduated from Washington Jefferson College and holds an MBA from Columbia University. Exactly. It was a true pleasure for me to speak to Charlie. He is just a pleasure to speak to. And uh, the fact that uh, I worked at Stiefel before made it even better for me. But for any of you who have never heard of a placement agent, I think this is going to be interesting for you. And as as Luke said, you'll be learning from the very best here. So spoke about the difference between placement agents today and uh, back when, when Charlie started Eaton Partners, the challenges that placement agents face, how they set themselves apart from competition, the types of analysis that they do. Uh, to make sure that they pick the correct fund managers or those that are more likely to be successful in fundraising and many other very interesting topics. So it was a true pleasure. I hope you enjoy it as much as that I did. Awesome. Thanks, Leo. And before we jump into the episode, if you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, which helps us out a lot. And now, without further ado, let's jump in. Hello, Charlie, and thank you for for agreeing to speak to us at the Wall Street Lab. Thank you, Leonardo. I look forward to it. Sure. I mean, I'm assuming that there are a lot of people who know what a placement agent is, but for those of us who don't, can you just very briefly give a, give a brief introduction of a of what a placement agent is? Oh, sure. Um, a placement agent is a specialized form of investment banking. We um, raise money for institutional money managers. And that means we're calling on endowments, pension funds, public and private foundations, other large investors on behalf of clients that hire us to help raise money for them, hence place their funds, in other words. And that's why we're called placement agents. You've been doing this for a while. I mean, uh, Eaton has been around since the 80s. Why don't you just tell us how you started in, in the placement agent business? Okay. Well, my background was I came out of Ohio, went to college. Um, after that, I was in the service for two years, a year of which was in the in Germany, in Bavaria. After that, I went to Columbia Business School and just sort of naturally migrated down to Wall Street. This was 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was working for Morgan Garrity Trust Company, which was the largest uh, asset manager at the time. And in those days, the only stocks and bonds were in asset classes that were involved with institutional investors. But after 15 years of working on Wall Street, eventually as a research salesman, I decided to start a business and um, leave the three-hour day commute behind. So just by happenstance, I um, came upon a couple of really interesting money management firms that didn't have much in the way of institutional investors. And I discovered that they would be interested in getting some help. So that that was the foundation of the of the business. When I first decided to start my own business, I really didn't know what I was going to get into, but it, it sort of naturally moved towards the investment world, which I had known before and found a niche in raising money for emerging money managers. Was that an existing industry back then, or, or were you one of the... Pioneers. Oh, no, there were no placement agents back then. To my knowledge, there were just three or four other people helping uh, money managers raise money, mostly long only managers, because uh, the alternative investment world as we know it today did not even exist in the early 80s. There were just a few firms that were already in the business of alternatives. And by alternatives, we mean 
anything beyond stocks and bonds. And today it runs a very wide gamut of venture capital, private equity, infrastructure, hedge funds, real estate, et cetera. But back in the early 80s, it was just beginning to be of interest to institutional investors. And there were a few early players like Colbert, Col- Colbert Kravis and Roberts in the hedge fund or in, in the private equity world. It was people like Kleinwert, hedge fund managers. Of course, George Soros was a well-known hedge fund manager in those days. But those were about the only ones that people really knew about. And so w- when I got into the business in 1983, I just happened to come across a couple of small firms that wanted to get in the alternative business and asked me to help them. And one thing led to another. And within five or six years, I realized that one could actually create a firm and have several other partners and represent several different asset managers in their fundraising needs. And Mm. that's kind of evolved from there. But the industry didn't exist really until the early 90s Mm -hmm. when some of the big New York firms, brokerage firms like Merrill Lynch, DLJ got into the business in a major way. But but really not until uh, the early 90s. We we talk about alternative investments these days and and you know every endowment fund spends quite a bit of of their of their time and resources on on alternatives but I'm assuming that back then uh, in the early 80s investing in a in a hedge fund or a private equity fund wasn't something that was uh, common to uh, institutional investors so what what were some of the challenges that you face that you faced then that you you maybe would laugh about today well The first thing is there was no database or source of information on who institutional investors were and what they might be interested in. Today, plenty of sources of information that that you can go by. But back then, you just had to call into uh, corporations and and large endowments and try to reach the person that might be interested in allocating some of their assets. That was a very laborious process, though, because just trying to find the right person to talk to was hard in itself. And then finding people that were, in those days, willing to even consider alternative investments, hedge funds, et cetera, was very hard and very rare. I remember that Yale was one of the very first endowments to be willing to invest in hedge funds and I believe they were early investors in Steinhardt, Fine, and Berkowitz, mm-hmm. and eventually they came in fairly early to Tiger Management, which be- which was one of my clients. So it was just, just beginning, and very, very few institutions even thought they should or could invest in alternatives. I mean, I'm assuming today, if you if you're working with, let's say, a private equity manager, and you have your, let's say, you're sending the documentation to an endowment, they will know what a private equity fund is, and they will know what a buyout fund oh, yeah. is. But back then, I'm assuming you had to educate them before even starting to if sell the product. Well, it was a lot of pioneering work, but it also was difficult to try to convince somebody to do something they hadn't already thought they might want to do. So it was really a lot of phone calls to um, cold calls, really, to try to find investors who are or institutions who are already thinking about getting into alternatives. And, you know, there weren't very many, but if you tried hard enough, you could find a few and that might be all you need to get a firm launched and, and succeed because there weren't that many competitors looking to raise money in alternatives in those days. There weren't that many managers looking to raise money. I I got lucky with a small um, buyout fund manager looking to raise $50 million and they were, they were struggling and they hired me. And, you know, at the time I couldn't think of more than a handful of firms looking to raise money for buyouts or to manage buyout funds. And the same thing with when I got involved with Julian Robertson with his hedge fund, there were very, very few hedge fund managers seeking institutional money. Mm -hmm. Real pioneering work in those days. Yeah. So how how did you start the relationship with uh, Julian Robertson? I had already raised money for a couple of small institutional asset managers. And a friend of mine knew Julian quite well, and I heard pretty good things about him from my friend. And 
I asked my friend if Julian would be willing to talk to me about maybe getting help in the institutional market. And within a couple of days, Julian said he wanted to meet with me. And so one thing led to another, and he, he very quickly decided to hire us because he didn't have any institutional money in those days. He had been in business for eight years, had a nice track record, but about $350 million under management and no institutional money. So he agreed to hire me for the institutional market. I added a couple of friends to help me because I was doing a couple of other things. And and that was really the beginning of the building of my organization. At that time, how many how many were you at, at Eaton? We ended up with, uh, it, this was about 1990. And mm-hmm. there were, when I brought in my friends, we ended up being four of us with a, a junior person. So total of five. Mm-hmm. And we represented five different firms. We found a firm in Edinburgh, Scotland, called Martin Curry. We had a firm in Memphis, uh, Southeastern Asset Management. We had Tiger, and then we had a New York firm and a couple of others that decided to try to work with us at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. The New York firm was uh, Angela Gordon, which became very, very large. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's the early 90s. So I think people start to to become aware of what hedge funds are and, you know, institutional investors at some point Mm -hmm. started looking at private equity as well with the Yale endowment being a pioneer there as well. So as you, as you move Mm -hmm. uh, through the nineties and get into the two thousands, what, what changed for you as a, as an, as a placement agent and as an industry? Well, we had some very, very large wall street firms uh, get into the business and with their great resources and relationships with, large asset managers that were looking to get into alternatives and also relationships with large institutions that were doing business with them for investment banking and and other research, et cetera. They became very, very large, very fast and left little firms like us behind. So we were, we were looking for business that they wouldn't take on because, you know, the funds were maybe too small or they were first time funds, which the big Wall Street firms didn't want to uh, take a risk with. So um, we kind of worked under what I call their umbrella, but we were able to take on some pretty exciting managers that had been turned down by the Wall Street firms. And we made a very nice business in the 90s doing that and were able to grow slowly with our own having to put up our own capital to keep growing but eventually we were able to capture a decent amount of the business and and, but the industry really took off there were hundreds of money managers seeking capital from institutions all types of strategies and we were able to capture some small but meaningful market share. Mm. What would you attribute the fact that you were able to capture a lot of market share to? I mean, was it the fact that you just knew the right people or were you doing better analysis or were you at better connecting uh, um, the dots? What was it? Well, we didn't raise more money than the big firms, but we raised enough to be very successful. We had a very good reputation from some of our early successes. So word of mouth and uh, people would hear about us and they would come to us, especially, and then typically we were out in Connecticut. Typically they'd go to the big well-known Wall Street firms that were getting big in the business first, and we'd end up getting the calls if they weren't big enough for the, our big competitors. We didn't mind that. We took our chances with some of them, and if we saw something that we thought was pretty unique and interesting strategy and attractive group that we thought we could raise money for, we would be willing to take a risk. I'm just curious. So whenever you see a, a new manager, I'm curious to to know what are the criteria that you look at to be able to assess whether you think okay. you'd be able to raise money for, for, mm-hmm. for the firm? That's a good question. So after many years, we've kind of discovered what institutional investors might be interested in. Mm-hmm. So there's certain criteria that makes an uh, asset manager credible and potentially attractive. So we've developed what we call a simple kind of guidelines. I call it my three to five rules. And that's real simple. It's easy to remember. I want three to five investment professionals together. I'd like them ideally to have worked together for three to five years. 
Now, that would mean that they might have had a really small business before they came to us, but at least they'd been working together. They got along well. You knew they weren't going to get into uh, a lot of arguments and, and split up after a couple of years. So, mm-hmm. so if they've already been working together for a couple of years, or perhaps they were lifting out of a big bank or a big asset management firm, but they'd already kind of had experience together, that, that took some of the risk away. Then I'd like to see a track record wherever they came from. It would be ideal if they had been running three or four or five hundred million dollars because it wasn't very important or interesting to an institutional investor if somebody had just based a track record on a small amount of money like thirty, forty million dollars. Most institutions want to invest anywhere from ten to a couple hundred million dollars with a manager and they don't want to dwarf his asset base. They want to be usually no more than 10% of, and so they have to know that the manager has and is capable of running several hundred million dollars. That's the third criteria. The fourth one is we'd like to see three or four, three to five investors that have known the group and known them from their prior affiliation and are willing to bet on them and commit to them in their new firm or in their next fund. And then lastly, uh, as a firm, we want to be able to raise three to $500 million, either in one fund or maybe the first couple of funds. So those are what I consider the three to five rules that are kind of similar criteria to what an institutional investor would want to see in a money manager. Mm-hmm. Now, having said all that, we have taken chances with new groups that don't have all of those. Mm-hmm. And we've taken chances with new strategies where there really hasn't been a track record because, and one example is an infrastructure fund that we worked on in 2004 before infrastructure was really a very well known and accepted asset class. And that we became extremely successful, but we took a chance at Wall Street had turned that firm down. Mm-hmm. We thought they were very interesting and willing to take a chance with them. Mm-hmm. These rules that you've developed over the years, you probably did through trial and error, I'm assuming. So you probably had some some less successful fundraises. Have you been able to pinpoint why some haven't worked well? Or maybe can you give an example? Well, sure. So the three to five rule is something we probably figured out about 25 years ago. It was logical, but also was based on some experiences we had. For example, we we had a couple of firms that, and and institutional investors soon had lots of experience with firms where the partners didn't get along, ended up breaking up the partnership and creating a huge mess for the investors. And um, so that's why it's really important to see that they've been able to work together for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And that kind of helps you think that they're probably going to get along. Other things that happen, our track records can go sour while you're out marketing. It takes a year or two to raise money for an emerging money manager, Mm -hmm. and their track record could look really good when we start off, but something might happen in in their portfolio that creates a real problem for investors, no longer looks attractive to them. I think it's really interesting that you focus on three to five investment professionals that understand, uh, that know each other well, because I'm curious to see if you've been able to empirically see if money managers, be it private equity or or, or infrastructure or hedge funds, if those that have one clear leader, a one-man show, are though, if those are mm-hmm. typically better or worse run than a fund that has maybe one or t- maybe two or three people that have equal say at the end. So is it better to have one person that calls all the shots or, or is it better to share some of that leadership? You know, I think most institutions are very comfortable with a really key star money manager that has a proven record and and yet they do like to see a team around that person to support them to help do the analysis to help find the deals a one-man show is is kind of hard to convince institutional investors to to put a lot of money with but as far as how many people are pulling the trigger 
Usually there's an investment committee. I think they're more comfortable knowing that. Also, there's always the fear when you get into an alternative fund that has a, a long life of maybe eight or 10 years and they're pretty much illiquid investments. You don't want to have the key man getting sick or ill or, or worse, and and then you're left with a small, unproven team to uh, try to work out with the next, with the end of the fund, which might be mm. years to come. Right. Yeah. And how about in terms of alignment of interests between the, the the money manager and the investors over over the years that you've been in the industry? Uh, do you think that is an important factor? Meaning, do you see any correlation between the amount of personal capital that the money manager puts into into his own or her own strategy as being yeah. having any predictability as to how the the strategy is going to work? Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly do, but there are cases where money managers just don't have the ability or the inclination to be willing to put much money up, mm -hmm. but institutional investors are smart and they want to have the investors that they're dealing with, the asset managers, have as much skin in the game as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's a negotiating point. I certainly am more comfortable knowing that the GP is going to have a lot of personal money along with their investors in the fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would assume uh, that it, that the performance will um, be better because mm -hmm. they're certainly going to watch it a lot more closely if they have a lot of their own money at risk. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I was just going to say, I've had some money managers that have had a lot, a lot of money in the funds. And I think that gives great comfort to people. And if they don't, if they're known to be wealthy and don't have a lot of money in the funds, it's a real problem. Often a general, an institutional investor will actually ask the general partners, well, what is your liquid net worth? And um, we'd like to see a significant amount of your liquid net worth, not your house and that sort of thing. But we'd like to see a lot of your significant amount of your liquid net worth alongside us in the fund. Mm -hmm. Investors probably have to take take their word for it because I don't think there is a there is a good way to check for that. Or do you think there is? I don't think there is. I think it's a promise and a and maybe a maybe a, a statement or even a written statement. Mm -hmm. But I don't think very many investors that I've seen have actually insisted on getting proof of one's uh, liquid net worth. They're okay. willing usually to take their word for it. Yeah, well, that's that's really interesting. And uh, so, so you moved through the the two thousands, and now you know we we let's we're today here in two thousand and nineteen, and you know there are quite a quite a few placement agents out there. There are a lot of asset classes that use mm -hmm. placement agents. So, as you said earlier, the definition of alternative investments has broadened quite a bit, and everyone knows what it is. There are now liquid alternatives. Has it become easier? Has your job become easier over time or has it become tougher because you have more competition? I think it's kind of competition has kind of moved along at the same pace as the amount of investors investing in uh, alternatives. There are thousands now that have billions of dollars to allocate to various different alternative strategies. And in some, some of the biggest now didn't exist 10 years ago. The sovereign wealth funds in many nations are the best example of that. They've dwarfed some of the big U.S. pension funds that used to be so dominant, like CalPERS and CalSTRS. Thankfully, there are not more investors that have a lot of money to invest. Secondly, the, the large institutions that have been around a long time are putting more and more of their assets into alternatives because they tend to perform better over time. And most of these investors are very long term oriented and, you know, they're looking for outperformance of their more conservative portfolios in stocks and bonds and alternatives have proven to do that for most investors over time. Yeah, the competition is large. There are hundreds of firms doing what we do. There are probably 20 to 30 that are quite large global firms like us. We're one of the top five in terms of size. And happily, about 10 or so, what were fairly large placement firms are no longer in the business. 
best example of that is Merrill Lynch, which in the 90s became one of the dominant placement firms. They are no longer in the placement business. They decided to get out about eight or nine years ago. The uh, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, of course, went out of business, but they were fairly, they were large in our business. They were bigger than we were at the time. Mm -hmm. Citibank was quite large. And there are other examples. So as some of those big players got out of the business, we were able to grow into that gap. And whereas we used to be a a much smaller firm than the big boys, Mm -hmm. we're now right up there (laughs) <laughs> as large and as global as any of them. Hmm. And, and why is that? Why, why do they, why, why do they, some of the big ones leave? Whether it wasn't a core strategy for Merrill Lynch and Citibank, or they just found it to be, um, you know, to, maybe they didn't like the cycle, the, um, the ups and downs, and just decided it wasn't worth staying in. I really can't say for sure what motivated some of them to get out, but maybe it just wasn't doing what they hoped it would do. And some of the European banks have also been sort of drifting away from the business. Hmm. In terms of, if you go back to 2008, how did the crisis affect you as a, as a business? Well, everything went into a standstill for maybe 12, 15 months. Institutional investors retrenched. They, they had to kind of pull back and think about their asset allocation and their asset mix. A lot of them discovered that while the markets were going down so dramatically, the liquid markets, a lot of them discovered that their illiquid investments in the alternatives, which are not necessarily easily to, easy to mark to market, those probably looked like they were a larger percentage of their asset base than they wanted them to be. And that's just because of the denominator effect as stocks and bonds fell in value. So it was like, oh my gosh, we got now we have more than our target in real estate or more more than our target in um, in private equity, et cetera. And so it was kind of a let's let's sit back and take a real hard look at what we've got before we make any new commitments. Oh, that's that's it's interesting. Okay, so today you said you're one of the top five placement agents in the world. You have offices, different continents. How how many people are there yeah. at Eaton today? Eaton Partners has 80 people. Mm-hmm. We're global. We have 10 offices, seven in the U.S., one in London, one in Shanghai, and one in Hong Kong. And I will mention that we were the first placement firm, including the great big firms, to have a actual office in the People Re- People's Republic of China, which we opened up in about 2004. After a couple of early successes raising some Asian funds, we decided that it could be a nice extension of our business. Mm-hmm. What made you do that? It's quite a bold move. I, I mean, it, it sounds from, what, from, from the 30 minutes that we've been on the phone that, one, you, you pioneered an industry back in the 80s and and here's another another example. So, what 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 made you move into mainland China? I think we've always been opportunistic and willing to um, grow the business in areas that look interesting to us. So, not only geographically into Europe in maybe 1999 or so, and then Asia in 2004 or five. We also were growing in terms of new asset classes, just taking advantage of opportunities that came our way and or that we thought would be worth pursuing. For example, in the early 90s, I thought distressed real estate would would be attractive to some investors, although I knew that a lot had had not had a good experience through the 80s when real estate fell in value. But I thought that some institutions would see that as an opportunity to buy in at very distressed values. So I went out and sought a money manager that could raise money and and legitimately attract institutional investors in, in their strategy of buying into distressed pools of real estate assets. And similarly, when we got into Asia, we found a, a small firm that was looking for help and we we're very successful in raising an Asian venture fund in 90, in 2004. Mm-hmm. And that success caused us to want to put more people over there. And, and we had one partner over there and we decided to add a few more people and look for more funds. And we very shortly found a few more that 
that were very interesting, one of which we've spent the last 10 years raising money for off and on as they needed to go out and seek new investors. So it was just a very lucrative expansion for us and and uh, just made sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were acquired by Stiefel in 2006, is that correct? 16. Oh, 16, sorry, 16. Ago. How did that come about? As we wanted to continue to grow the firm, to move into the vacuum created by the, some of the larger firms getting out of the business and just create more, seize more opportunities that we saw, we constantly looking for how are we going to grow the business when we still are looking for cash flow from you know our recent successes and mm-hmm. decided that we're a big global firm now. Maybe we can, and we were by far and away the largest independent firm and we just decided it would make sense to try to find a financial institution that would be interested in our global capabilities and willing to finance us going forward okay all of a sudden uh, after uh, over 30 years being an independent company (laughs) now you are owned by a publicly traded company how does that change your day-to-day well, mostly it doesn't because the firm that acquired us is uh, Stiefel Financial. It's a medium-sized uh, broker, bank, investment bank. They were not in our business before, so they looked at us as an expansion for them. They've made 20 acquisitions, actually more in the last 15 or 20 years, of different financial firms, banks, brokers, money managers, et cetera. And they um, typically let them operate as they had been as wholly owned subsidiaries. And in our case, since they weren't already in our business, they were, they were willing to kind of leave us in our current offices and all of our people and, and actually have financed the growth. We've added uh, about 15 people since they acquired us. So it's been, and then there's some synergies. There's some investment banking business that they've been able to get us involved in. Um, We're now doing more, direct private placements of individual company investments as opposed to just the fund business that we were in before. So so that's been very nice. And just having a nice financial partner. We spent a year looking for the right firm to align ourselves with, and we had quite a few interests, including one very large global bank, but we were really not interested in being part of a big global financial institution where we'd get lost. I think we're a significant part of Stiefel, and we've been able to have our best two years in a row now, by far, that be, you know, since they acquired us. I used to work at Stiefel as well, so I know them b- mm-hmm. a bit better, and it was a great company to work for. So, And I do remember them purchasing a few smaller brokerage companies, so that's very interesting. So... If I, if I put my LP hat on and I, I look at, you know, the, the relationships that we have with different placement agents, you, I think the breadth of quality is very, <laughs> is very big. Um, so you, you have some that are very mm-hmm. high quality and others that they, they are selling, they're selling investments in fund managers, but they could as well be selling cars. <laughs> So they're not very institutionalized. <laughs> I'm glad you. to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's good news for you. But I mean, how does a placement agent add value to limited partners? Because your end client is actually the GP, not the LP. So, but you, you still need to keep mm-hmm. the LPs coming. So how do how do you balance those two? I think we add some credibility to a manager that we represent because we don't want to waste time and we don't want to waste the investor's time on, um, you know, managers that we haven't vetted and spent a lot of time thinking about and discussing internally whether we think they're the right kind of firm to go to represent and put our put our firm and our reputation behind. We're not always right, but at least we do try and I think we help the managers put together their story in a professional way. We help them with their documentation, their presentations, et cetera. And that, that's helpful to the institutional investors who are inundated by placement agents and money managers trying to get capital from them. And uh, they just don't have a lot of time to look at everything that uh, people would like them to look at. So maybe we help in that process by narrowing down certain types of funds. I think we 
we respect the uh, institutional investors' time. We don't force ourselves in a meeting that we don't think they're potentially interested in. In other words, we, we send them material, we talk to them we, ahead of time. We do all that for the manager. And and if uh, at the end of uh, several calls and emails, et cetera, and, and mailings, we determine along with the institutional investor that this is maybe a, a fund that they would indeed like to hear more about and meet the the principals, then we set up a meeting. We don't. We just don't push meetings. We don't want to waste their time, our time, or, or the um, or the GP's time. And I think that's probably respected. The problem is that, and this gets back to one of your earlier questions. There, there are so many fund managers trying to raise money. So not only do we have competition, but so do our clients. I mean. Back in the early 90s, when I was looking for money for that distressed real estate manager, there weren't more than five other firms, one of which was Goldman Sachs and I think maybe Morgan Stanley at the time, that were actually looking for large amounts of money, i.e. institutional money, for real estate, distressed real estate. So we were one of five, and that's that was a little bit easier to... Now, if we go out with a real estate fund, we're liable to have hundreds of managers out trying to raise money for real estate at the same time. And we're all kind of trying to call on the same large institutional base, and they're just hearing from so many wannabe money managers and it, what it's done is that that's the competition that is really tough. And it stretched out the time frame to raise a fund by, oh, maybe an average, probably 50%. So if you used to be able to get a fund raised, a, a first time fund, an unknown group, it might take, maybe it used to take nine to 12 months and might take 18 to 24 months to complete the fund raise now mm. because they're just, so much out there and the institutions don't have time to spend. And even though they take an interest, it's a couple of months before they have the next meeting and willing to think about it again. And even to just get a single investor committed to an asset manager now takes a year mm. and multiple calls, multiple meetings, multiple sets of information, probably the diff- the most difficult Mm-hmm. change that's taken place is the competition of fund managers and the time it takes to uh, get the attention and commitments out of institutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so basically now you have to do the the job of a of an investor, of a limited partner, and be able to pick out of the the many managers that you now have available in your example in, in real estate, mm-hmm. you have to be able to pick the one that mm-hmm. isn't going to be most likely the, the the most successful. So is that is that the case? Mm-hmm. So you have a team of people at Eaton that... So the way we're organized, like most big firms like us, we're organized in three different areas. We've got the new business development folks. They're always looking and they're always hearing from managers. I got a call a couple hours ago from a manager that's been around a long time that wants help with a couple of new funds. We get calls every day, but we're just as interested in talking to to GPs that haven't called us that we've heard about that we've we seek out to uh, try to see if we can get involved with them. So we have, I think, probably all together ten or twelve people just concentrating mostly on trying to find new GPs to represent. And by the way, we'll do ten or fifteen funds in a year's time. Some we're finishing up with, some we're getting involved in, and some we're we're just launching or right smack in the middle of. And then we have project managers. We have at least 10 professional, experienced folks here, guys and gals that manage the fund process once we get the client to hire us. And they're going to work on all the documents, presentation materials, private place of memorandum, advise the um general partners on certain aspects of their, well, partly how to tell their story, but also the uh, structure of their funds, the fees and the size, the appropriate size for their fund, their fund target. And they're also going, those same project managers will be reporting to the general partners on a regular basis, often weekly, on everything that we're doing for them, all the progress that's being made, tracking of uh, prospective investors, 
uh, who's moving along in interest and who's just lost interest and what for what reason and what what can we learn from that. And uh, they also manage the salesman to make sure that the salesman and the general partner that we're representing are doing their job in uh, in selling to the interested institutions, following up properly. And then we have, of course, the salesman that we probably have a total of 20, 25 counting our hedge fund group that are just purely in, on, on the side of covering the institutional investors in their geographic coverage. And that's interesting. And, and, and in your experience, what types of investors are those that, that do the most thorough due diligence? Is it the, the consultants or the endowments? Or? Well, it's definitely the consultants. They, are, they have staffs of people and they see so many different funds and it's their job to do as much good research as they can on as many funds as, as are shown to them that they think might be of interest to their clients. But I would say, secondly, or maybe just as just as much, it would be the endowments and foundations. They're very smart people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they tend to stay in their jobs longer. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're compensated better, and, and so there's less turnover. But they're pretty savvy. Mm -hmm. They talk to one another. They learn from their uh, peers <laughs> what's of interest. And um, you know, sometimes if you get one endowment, you might get several others to follow just mm -hmm. because they're talking to one another. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Charlie, you mentioned earlier that I think you said about half of all of the the uh, fundraisers that you've done as a, as a firm are with first-time funds. Why, why first-time funds? Why don't you just go to the fund number four or five? It's probably easier, isn't it? We would love to, but as I said early on, a lot of those fund, well, first of all, the, the four or five fund managers, they don't necessarily need placement agents. They, If they've been around long enough, they might have built their own internal sales force or, or um, uh, IR group that will also handle their fundraisers, and, and they would staff up if they're really getting quite large. And as I said before, the bigger firms would get the more established funds uh, that wanted placement agents. And and we were kind of left with those that they rejected. So we found, frankly, I'm very proud of our track record of being willing to work with emerging, and I mean really emerging managers that 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 are either in a totally new strategy that maybe are bigger in those days, bigger competitors weren't willing to take a risk with, mm -hmm. or they were just too small and we were willing to work with them. But we raised one fund that came to us for $500 million and we got $3 billion for them. And oh, wow. they had been turned down by Wall Street. Why was that? We Sorry. Yeah. Frankly, I think I'd like it. Well, they were unknown. They, were, they came out of a bank. There were five people that had done infrastructure, really not equity investments, but mm -hmm. they, were, they were large investment bankers at Citibank that did a lot of infrastructure loans and knew the industry, and but they didn't have experience investing equity because mm -hmm. the bank, Citibank, wasn't willing to invest equity. But they had a good story and they had a good kind of niche that they, and, and they had a team. They'd been four or five guys who worked together for 10 years. And so we, they had some of the ingredients we looked for and we really liked the strategy. And it was at a time when, the, uh, again, this was a a fund that didn't have more than three or four competitors and, and a couple of them were not competitive because of their their fees and their and their pretty weak track records so we we took them on and we got about four times the amount of capital that we were uh, initially seeking mm -hmm. five times six times what they came to us looking for what i was saying is uh, we're, i'm really proud of our willingness to uh, get involved in something new and different and what most excites me is if strategy doesn't have a lot of competitors. And right now we've got two very large uh, billion dollar plus assignments, which are first time funds, but they're very sponsored by quite large institutions. So that helps bring some credibility, but most important, they have unique strategies and maybe just a handful of firms offering to do are capable of doing the same thing again it's not three or four hundred firms out trying to raise money for the same strategy that really attracts me so often the first time funds that we see 
are ones that have something new and different to offer and don't have hundreds of firms out there doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So you've been, I mean, you've been vetting money managers for over 40 years now. In your experience, have you been able to capture what is it that makes a strong performing money manager in terms of personality traits, anything that you've been able to pick up over the years? That's a hard one, and I don't know that I have a good answer for that. It's awfully hard to know how a manager is actually going to perform over the next eight to 10 years. You know, some are going to do fine and some are not, and that's that's just the nature of the of the business and, and the cycles that some of these, well, that the funds have to go through and the economic environment and changes that have to take place. But I think large institutional investors that are looking for very diversified portfolio of alternative strategies are very aware that some are going to work and some are not going to work. But if you diversify and kind of have pretty well-honed criteria to begin with and diversify enough, the winners are going to offset the losers and you're going to do just fine. Mm -hmm. And I've never experienced an institution that got terribly upset when they invested in a fund that didn't do particularly well, because I think they, first of all, they do far more research than we can and due diligence that we possibly can do because they get the consultants and they have a lot more resources. Mm -hmm. And so that they're, and they're all professional and they know that this is a, a, a business where there are things to change and people change and people get hurt and people, you know, kind of die and, and keep, keep key person's risk, but that's just something that you have to accept. But as far as, as far as the traits that go to make somebody really successful, I guess some of the most successful I know are, are money managers that really know their industry. They have a couple of them thinking about have incredible relationships far and wide in their niche. And, and by the way, most of what we do and most of what institutions do nowadays is very narrow focus, looking for very specific expertise, whether it's real estate, whether it's apartments or residential or industrial, or whether it's healthcare, energy, upstream, midstream, downstream. They look for niche exper expertise, and that's what they're seeking and that's what they'll buy into mm -hmm. and you know the different cycles that these different strategies and groups go go through and and asset classes go through kind of offset one another but in the end hopefully they'll do just fine in in, in the main or in the sum mm -hmm. and that's what it's all about so we seek money managers have special unique uh, relationships and expertise in their field. Mm -hmm. One we did very successfully was aerospace and aerospace parts and turbine engine parts manufacturers. It was an extremely unique and successful group. Another one we've been doing work on is a healthcare group with a, with a very good track record and, and special relationships. So they see deal flow. So it's, it's things like that. We've got some specialized hedge fund managers that are in, in, in narrow scope that we think are going to do quite well in, in their field because of mm -hmm. their knowledge and, and backgrounds. Uh, that's that, that's 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 a very good answer. Thank you. So, when when I look at you know the the asset management industry in general, it seems to me that the industry is very inefficient because. It, it's it's still very much based on relationships, and that's part of the reason why you as a firm would exist. You're connecting the dots. Your your people trust you with your analysis and with the with with the decisions that you make. Do you see if there are any threats to the industry? Is technology something that you worry about going forward? Not really. Technology, if anything, has probably helped the industry more than hurt. It's um. It's added a lot of computerized uh, asset, access to databases and wealth of information you get from certain organizations that have um, you know, kind of built their practice around just knowledge and information gathering and dissemination to folks that are interested. So, no, I, I don't 
worry too much about it. I, I just worry about the thousands of money managers that keep coming into the business to compete for the dollars. It's getting tougher and tougher. Now, I'm not worried about our competitors in the placement industry because we're one of the biggest and best and we get our share of the business. It's just tougher and tougher to, to uh, raise the money. Mm -hmm. But the good news is there's more money out there. They, you know, I mean, you know, raising a um, couple hundred million dollar fund. Well, when I first started, a $50 million fund was a big deal. Then it became a couple hundred million dollar fund was a big deal. Now they're billion dollar funds. And, you know, in our kind of uh, our, our current list of um, clients we're raising money for, we've got, oh, I think at least five that are multi-billion dollar funds, which mm -hmm. would have been unheard of 20, 25 years ago. So, so there's more money that's bigger. The commitments are bigger. You know, commitments are anywhere from five to 25 to $400 million for, for one investor to commit to one fund. You know, that, that's just overwhelming and wasn't that way 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Biggest order you'd get would be uh, 50 to 100 million. And even that was very unusual. Mm -hmm. Charlie, just one last question. You, I mean, you've, you've built a business from ground up. I'm sure that there are a few things that you've done right <laughs> over the years that maybe people mm -hmm. could, could take from. Can you maybe share one or two things that you think have been a, a good, a big contributor to your success? Well, I, I've been lucky and I've sought out a few folks and strategies, but but I, I think clearly it's been luck. I was willing to be an entrepreneur, which not everybody has the stomach for, and because along with that comes risk. I had a lot of patience. I didn't make a lot of money in this business for the first six or seven years. I had a few successes, but they, they weren't terribly lucrative, but it was just kind of early days of the industry and I stuck with it and my wife supported me as opposed to, Hey, when are you going to get a real job and go get a paycheck again? In the early days, I did have a partner that started with me, but after about a year, he did go back to wall street because he lost patience and um, I think his family needed him to get a paycheck too. <laughs> but I was willing to take chances uh, in a lot of different situations, some of which worked, some didn't, but I just learned to be patient and to um, have confidence that I was on to something that was very different and willing and, and really able to create something that was um, quite different. And, you know, none of the people that were doing, I, I mentioned earlier, there were four or five guys that I knew that were raising money for money managers, some long only, just a few doing, you know, alternatives because that wasn't very much in vogue those days, but none of those people are, only one guy still in the business and he's still a one man chop and <laughs> always wanted to stay small and all the rest are long gone. I don't know where they've gone. Merrill Lynch is gone. Some of the bigger players are gone. And I'm just proud of the fact that we've hung in there and become one of the biggest, never really expected to be and by far the biggest independent firm before we sold to Stiefel. So it's been a long road with a lot of bumps, as, a, as there always are for entrepreneurs, but it's been a fun and challenging one. And all in all, I look back on it and say it's been, uh, it's been very interesting. Well, that's great, uh, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you very much for for taking the time, first of all, and for sharing a lot of your of of, of your knowledge that you've acquired over the last in the last uh, forty years. It's been a true pleasure. So, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your interest and for your patience in listening to all of this. So, um, Leonardo, I hope we meet someday. So, if you're ever here in Connecticut, come see us, or if you're in New York, and thanks for being interested. Thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast. For the show notes and much more, visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com. To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not be treated as investment, tax, 
financial, or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only, and it does not contain an offer to sell or buy any sort of financial products, and should not be treated as advertisement for such. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the prior permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.